Welcome to the Humanity Dialogues. I am Molly Brunson, Associate Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures and History of Art at Yale University. And today I welcome you as Faculty Director of the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies Program at the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. This event today has been sponsored by the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies Program. The Humanity Dialogues has been organized as a response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It is a conversation, a continuing conversation, to reflect on contingency as existence and the critical intertwining of art and politics within societies at war. Today, we are offering the second conversation in our series. And I'm going to um, have the, the link in the chat. There will be a link in the chat uh, for you to subscribe to our mailing list so that you can be notified of future events. And in fact, our next dialogue will take place this Friday, March 18th at noon. The topic on Friday will be the nuclear vulnerabilities that have emerged in the war in Ukraine. Today's topic is just as urgent. It is tyranny and cyber resistance. And we're very lucky to have as our guests today two prominent leaders on this question with a third guest. Scott Shapiro is the Charles F. Southmaid Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at Yale Law School. His areas of interest include jurisprudence, international law, constitutional law, criminal law, and cybersecurity. Yuliana Shemetovitz is a Belarusian activist and spokeswoman on behalf of the Cyber Partisans. And as director of the organizing committee for the Belarus Liberty nonprofit organization, Yuliana focuses on using technologies to empower civil societies and to advocate for human rights. We will also be joined a bit later on by Ivan, who is a cyber activist currently working in Ukraine. Our conversation today will be moderated by my co-organizer for the Humanity Dialogues, Marta Kuzma. Marta is a professor of art and a former dean of the Yale School of Art. She spent the 1990s in Kiev, Ukraine, founding and directing the Soros Center for Contemporary Art. So please join me in welcoming our guests for today. Thank you, Molly. And I am so grateful for the cooperation we've had in this series, which I feel is very important and is proceeding onwards um, from this week to next week. Uh, Scott, Juliana, uh, we are just going to start this conversation. There's a lot to discuss in terms of cyber activism uh, unfolding. And particularly, I'm also in, interested in hearing from Ivan, who is here. Uh, anonymously, uh, and but of course, someone who I am very grateful for that is 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 joining today courageously um, from within Ukraine. The first question, Juliana, I have is perhaps you may explain uh, what what and who are the cyber partisans, if you may. Sure. So, cyber partisans is a highly organized collective of activists that are trying to overthrow Lukashenko's regime. They're mostly famous for the attacks on the regime's infrastructure, agencies, and institutions. And they, their movement symbolically evolved in 2020 when people in Belarus, peaceful protesters, were uh, forcefully beaten up by policemen and in many cases illegally imprisoned, tortured, um, in some cases even raped in prison cells. So they started to post video clips on the Belarus national TV and the internet showing how people were beating up. And then since the regime didn't change anything, they didn't try to build a dialogue, they didn't release political prisoners, they just continued the oppression, the terror towards Belarusian people, they decided to start attacking the regime uh, since there were no other ways to you know, show the dissatisfaction uh, to actively resist what the regime was doing. And uh, as a reminder, Lukashenko is in power in Belarus for 27 years. So he successfully consolidated the regime um, and um, you know, started the terror towards people. Um, cyber partisans are also part of the larger coalition, Supertif Movement. There are two other groups there. It's Self-Defense Brigade and Flying Storks. And I think now it's a good time to show maybe the video of the victory plan that this group um, is kind of set up before even the war started, but we can get to the question of the war and how cyber partisans now helping um, Ukrainians as well. Let me share my screen.
Внимание! Мы не кровожадные радикалы отморозки, которыми вас пугают по телевизору. Мы обычные граждане, как и каждый из вас. Мы любим нашу страну и ценим каждого человека. Мы простые белорусы, которых очень разозлили. Фаза X. Фаза X. Это отрезок времени, в любой момент которого может быть объявлен бессрочный протест. Мы проведем ряд спланированных мероприятий, направленных на ослабление карательного потенциала, что приведет к необратимым последствиям. Эти действия позволят всем в стране понять, что мы вступили в период общенациональной готовности, и в любой момент настанет время народного выступления по всей стране. Момент X. Момент X является точкой запуска акций, направленных на устранение фашистского режима. Это начало бессрочного протеста вплоть до победы. В этот период будут совершены кибератаки на инфраструктуру террористического режима, в том числе нашими соратниками, которые парализуют сеть изнутри при помощи приложения XUP. Это облегчит успешное выполнение акций партизанскими организациями и иными группами. Партизанское сообщество будет мобилизовано с помощью карты уязвимых точек, на которой будут отображены тысячи уязвимых мест режима по всей стране. Любой партизан или группа сможет открыть карту, прочитать детальную инструкцию по выполнению данной акции самостоятельно. Обнародование карты и одновременные удары оттянут карателей от центров наших городов. Карта частично готова и разрабатывается движением супротив с помощью информации, которую вы присылаете на наш анонимный бот. Отряды специальных операций буслы летят, действуют самостоятельно, но в рамках единой координации. В их задачи входят диверсионные работы, изоляция, либо устранение определенных лиц в зависимости от сложившейся ситуации. В целях успеха миссии мы не можем распространить подробную информацию публично. Дружины народной самообороны мы знаем, что большая часть белорусов уже не готова выходить на улицы для того, чтобы быть избитыми. При следующем массовом выходе людей на улице все изменится. ДНС – это механизм защиты общества от карателей, считающих себя хозяевами жизни, избивая безоружных мирных граждан, в том числе пенсионеров и детей. Основная цель ДНС – защита людей на акциях гражданского неповиновения, блокировка карательных сил, либо их уничтожение, в зависимости от сложившейся обстановки. Мы считаем, что общество должно прийти к осознанию, что в ответ на насилие мы должны организовать самооборону. Щит который прикроет, когда понадобится щит, которым мы так давно нуждаемся. There we go. I think that was a pretty powerful video um, where we also consider the experience in Ukraine. Um, so we do understand that in Belarus, people on the ground are also very important. So at this point, it's only possible to resist the regime uh, by doing cyber attacks. Uh, we do have successful partisan groups now trying to disrupt railways as well in order to stop the movement of Russian military troops. And, um, you know, the, the Belarusian territory is now a very strategic point because the Belarusian Ukrainian border is very close to Kiev. And Kiev is the, as we know, the target number one. Um, so a combination of the cyber attacks and the uh, partisan groups and attacks on the ground show the, um, the possibility to stop the trains. Because of the cyber attacks, we now know that all the trains are on the manual mode and Russian forces cannot use the uh, military trains. They tried to find a workaround to, in, in order to bring over ammunition, tanks, rocket launchers to the border with Ukraine, uh, but so far they cannot be um, you know, 
properly functional and they cannot bring over everything that they need. So we understand we can't stop the, the trains maybe uh, of Russian trains forever, but even if we can slow it down and uh, win some time for Ukrainians to regroup, to prepare for the, for the attack that can come from the Belarusian uh, side, it will be super helpful. So that is kind of the point for cyber partisans right now. Um, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Juliana. I, I, I guess I want to just uh, start off by saying that, for, like many of us who first learned about the cyber partisans, um, I, I'll just confess I heard about it last week. I read about it last week um, uh, in connection with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But as you point out, it's been it's the partisan movement has actually been. Um, an internal Belarusian resistance movement um, really focused on, um, on um, well, that's the question. <laughs> I guess the question is, what is your strategy? Um, uh, what was your, I should, let me, let me uh, bring this back. In 2020, after um, the election where Lukashenko claimed to have won in an overwhelming um, vote, um, uh, which almost certainly was fraudulent. Um, the, this is when uh, the partisan movement began. How did you, what was your strategy at the beginning? What were you hoping to achieve? And then maybe talk about how it's, it's uh, evolved. Sure. So I think at the very, very beginning when cyber partisans showed the, uh, the clips uh, of people being getting out by police officers, it was um, a kind of a symbolic gesture to show and um, try to advocate and reach out to people who potentially are, are still supporting Lukashenko. But since the situation didn't change, even more people got detained, many people were getting up, had to flee the country, had to leave their work. Uh, they decided to consolidate their forces with people on the ground and starting to attack the regime just because people didn't have any other tools to protest. There was nothing. Um, so that's when, you know, they founded this separative movement. Uh, that's when they started to build uh, groups and coordinative actions within Belarus because there were nothing pretty much happening at this time. People were too afraid, too suppressed by the regime. So there should, that's when they realized, you know, you have to have also people there. Um, so the strategy at the very beginning um, was created the following. We have to overthrow the Lukashenko's regime. Uh, we have to keep the sovereignty and independence of Belarus. It was even before Russian forces brought over their troops and military and machinery and all of this, because we know that Russia also doesn't want to let, Russian regime doesn't want to let Belarus from its own sphere of influence, the same they do with Ukraine. So it was clear from the very beginning, you know, we will have to fight in a sense Russian regime as well. Um, so independence and sovereignty is the second point. And the third one is, of course, the transition to democratic state, the return of rule of law, independent institution, independent court and protection of human rights. Um, so the strategy stayed the same. They're still working on achieving this. Obviously, war now um, changed a little bit the, uh, the perception and the tactics. Uh, but we do believe still now that, you know, without the independent Ukraine, now there is also no chance for Belarus. So Ukrainians are fighting for Belarusians in a sense as well. That's why cyber partisans are helping Ukrainians in this war to deter Russian aggression. Uh, they attack the railways, as I mentioned before, but they also publicly said that we will help with any information, knowledge, tips that you need in order to attack Russian infrastructure though cyber partisans are still focusing on Belarus. Okay. So so we, before, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sure, just before we, get, before we get to your activities, uh, not your activities, but cyber partisan activities, because you're a spokesperson for, for the group, you're not involved in any active operations as I understand it. Um, so can you just, uh, uh, just tell us like how, how the, how, the activities of the cyber partisans evolved. Um, my understanding is that when it began, um, it involved a web face defacement, it involved injection of information in, um, on the media. Can you please tell us about that? Sure, so yes, that started like that. They defaced some websites, they put on videos, they 
you know, try to attack websites that a regime is using, uh, either defacing it or, or putting up information about the resistance movement and what's actually going on in Belarus. So the followers of Lukashenko can also see this. But at some point, they realize it's not enough. You know, they have to attack the key infrastructure or state-run companies. Um, and one of the first and major attacks that they committed uh, was to uh, the attack on the Ministry of Interior Affairs, the so-called passport database. Uh, the, for that attack, they had people on the ground who, um, you know, went to this um, agency and then they opened the network for cyber partisans to go in and then gather the information about the people working for the regime. Uh, they were able also to find the um, wide trapped conversations between um, policemen and high level officials uh, confirming that they were committing crimes. They published it on their official uh, YouTube channel so you can all you know, hear um, what they were discussing and what crimes they were discussing. For example, beating up unlawfully people in the streets and then unlawfully putting them into prisons. Um, so they released this information. They released information about spies also uh, outside of Belarus. Um, they collaborated with many investigative uh, committees, with many nonprofits, opposition groups, providing data on uh, the regime, on the crimes that the regime committed. Um, so that helped a lot, um, that the first major attack, but then they again realized that they need to show more, they need to attack more, and also in that sense showing that uh, the regime didn't invest enough into the state-run companies, they don't have enough protection, they don't care about protecting personal data of people, uh, ordinary citizens as well, um, so it's, you know, obviously disrupting the regime, but it's also showing how Lukashenko's regime is unreliable, not only for Belarusians, but any business partners from other countries as well. So the tactic was to disrupt as much as possible the regime, but in a very strategic way, I would say, because they're collaborating, as I mentioned before, with people on the ground. Um, so they you know, do talk with people who have access to these um, in networks or who understand how these agencies or uh, factories are working. Uh, they understand what can harm um, the regime. Uh, again, also cyber partisans do want to harm ordinary citizens, and it still stays the same. That's why they're very careful in their attacks. They plan it for long months just to make sure that ordinary citizens are not affected. Um, so for that reason, it's um, an interesting balance of getting some feedback from people on the ground, from getting feedback from citizens, and then planning these attacks in order to disrupt the regime and to harm the regime as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So, so basically, as I hear it is, so it started off obviously at the very beginning with def website defacement and um, uh, trying to get information into the public sphere that had been censored. Then it moved to what in the United States we call doxing, which is the release of private information, not for the purposes here of, uh, of um, uh, to, to, to harm innocent people, but to reveal um, the number one, it sounds to me like who's collaborating with whom. Number two, it's a way of showing the insecurity of the government as it doesn't, it not only doesn't protect its citizens data, it doesn't even protect its own, um, its own um, uh, officials data because it thinks it's invulnerable. Um, things have now shifted, as I understand it, um, to uh, what we would call attacks on critical infrastructure um, that is um, uh, affecting the railways that are going from Belarus um, into uh, Ukraine. Um, either maybe, so we, we have Ivan, who is, um, uh, uh, first of all, welcome Ivan. And are, um, um, are, uh, right now, are you in Ukraine? I'm, I'm sorry, do we want to talk about where you are? Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, I'm in Ukraine, yes. yes are, 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 are you Belarusian or um, of origin or Ukrainian? No, I'm Ukrainian and uh, my topic is uh, Ukrainian cyber partisans and uh, our personal battle. I see. So the Ukrainian cyber partisans are working with the Belarusian cyber partisans? Uh, I think so, that um, in uh, some cases, yes, uh, they work together, 
but um, uh, personally myself, I am not an IT specialist and uh, I wanted to say about Ukrainian cyber partisans from like um, the view of uh, uh, just an ordinary person, uh, because uh, for me, it's the most interesting thing that uh, everybody who wants to be part of this uh, organization can be part of this organization and you uh, you don't need special tech skills or something like that. And uh, for me, it's the main difference. Not, not the main difference, but uh, it's the difference. And of course, <laughs> the main difference for me is that um, our cyber partisans are not against our government. Our cyber partisans are organized by our government. I, so I, 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 have, a, I have a question, actually. Ivan, um, Privit. <laughs> Дякую, що ви брати участь сьогодні. On February 26th, your Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine, Mikhailo Fedorov, had issued a tweet and an announcement. He's also the Minister of Digital, uh, of, uh, Digital Informations of Ukraine that basically called for the building of an IT army and said that, that that's for me, that I, from what I can recall, it's the first time a foreign um, a government has asked for a building of an IT army. Is that, was that call something that had um, led you to become involved? Uh, yes, uh, uh, IT army, which is organized by Federy is uh, one of possibilities uh, which you can join. And uh, it's the biggest IT army right now because uh, it all started with 10,000 people, 10,000 partic uh, participants. But right now there are about uh, 300,000 people in this IT army and uh, the power of this army is really very, very high because um, uh, the main point is uh, the DOS attacks on governmental sites and uh, very popular sites in uh, Russia. Um, and of course they have uh, special software which can protect them from these DDoS attacks, but uh, this software can protect, uh, uh, for example, from 5,000 or 10,000 DDoS attacks, but uh, nothing can protect from 300,000 DDoS attacks at one moment. So this is really very, very powerful scene. And um, as a result, a lot of uh, governmental sites uh, are down right now, and uh, uh, they are down for a long period of time. And so, just to, just so for people out there, a DDoS is a distributed denial of service attack. It involves multiple um, users um, flooding uh, particular resources on the internet in order to exhaust them so that they um, cannot respond. Um, and so that so. If you have 300,000 people um, sending requests to, let's say, a Russian website, it will overload it. So that's, um, and, and, and of course, I mean, 300,000 sounds like an enormous amount, but it, 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 we should remind everyone that um, though the invasion happened in, happened, what, two weeks ago in 2022, Ukraine has been um, bombarded by cyber attacks for eight for eight long years, um, and so uh, I would imagine that the people in Ukraine have uh, the IT specialists have excellent cybersecurity uh, defense and probably offense skills now. Before before um, uh, we have Ivan talk about what's happening on the ground, I, I really want to just go back just briefly to Juliana and just tell us about. Um, the uh, you had mentioned it before, but the attack on the railways in uh, Belarus, because this sounds to me like a very significant thing to have done. Can you please describe it, and then we'll um, move over to Ivan and say what's happening in um, in Ukraine. Sure. So the attack, the first attack happened. Um, they ran the system actually in December 2021, but the first major attack happened on January 23rd when Russian forces already brought over their troops. Um, they, at that time, they said it's for the joint exercise with the Belarusian soldiers. It's not the preparation for the war, but already for us, it seemed like it's the first step either to start a war or to even the, to occupy Belarus, which obviously Belarusians are against. 
Um, so the first attack uh, was target uh, was targeting the cargo freight trains, not the passenger trains. Cyber partisans actually had access to emergency system, but they decided not to touch that because they didn't know how it would affect ordinary citizens. Uh, so it did slow down the movement of Russian trains, of all the trains, to be honest. Um, but um, you know, the major attack happened since the war started, uh, and that attack um, was directed at the internal networks. I can't give you the specifics of exactly what happened, just because the attack is still kind of going on. Uh, cyber partisans are still trying to disrupt the movement of such trains, uh, but we know for sure that now they're using the manual uh, mode to, to move these trains, and it is hard and it is dangerous. That's why Russians decided not to use their um, the, the military trains that they used before to bring over everything they needed from Russia to the border of Belarus and Ukraine. Um, so in, in that sense, we have some feedback also from internal employees saying that they don't have enough people. People don't know how to use this manual mode. Uh, everyone is used to do everything automized. You know, everyone is digital these days. Uh, also, many people were laid off because of the political reasons back in 2020, 2021, when people were protesting. So it's hard for them to even, you know, bring back anyone with experience. Uh, and they also, in a sense, um, don't um, kind of want to, they don't feel motivated. They all see what's going on right now and how Belarus now use the grounds are used uh, for the Russian purposes. Um, so it, it is basically the, the railways now in, this, in the kind of state of collapse, though passenger trains are still working, so ordinary citizens are not affected. I see. Okay, thank you. Um, may, um, Ivan, can I move over to you within, within the bounds of security? Um, um, can you maybe describe what um, uh, the Ukrainian uh, cyber partisans have been doing um, and what, and maybe if it was, um, again, within the bounds of uh, personal security for you, um, tell us what you have been um, uh, doing. Okay, of course. Uh, I'll start with uh, cyber partisans in Ukraine in general, because um, I think that uh, personally me, uh, I was involved in two different types of cyber uh, partisan uh, movement, and I can describe these two parts. Uh, the first one is uh, IT Army, which is organized by our government. And uh, I already mentioned that uh, we are just uh, organizing massive data attacks. Um, first of all, it all started with uh, uh, sites because uh, organizers, uh, IT specialists, they uh, created special sites uh, and uh, we just uh, opened the link and uh, started these DDoS attacks. Right now we have special software which uh, is very, very helpful and which increases uh, uh, this DDoS attacks um, in, in many times and uh, makes it much more uh, effective. Uh, so I think that uh, in general it's uh, quite the same uh, with uh, Belarusian uh, cyber partisans or something like that. So I won't uh, stop on this part. Uh, the second part is uh, also very important personally for me uh, because I tried to do it myself and now we have a special organization uh, also uh, to uh, like uh, make this movement uh, more um, powerful, something like that. Um, we try to spread uh, truth. We try to spread uh, real information inside Russia because uh, uh, we all understand that uh, uh, their propagandic machine is very, very strong. And uh, <laughs> it's very, uh, it, it, it's even a little bit uh, funny because uh, people in Russia uh, who is uh, also 19 years old or even 20 years old, it's uh, people the same age as me, they were born inside this regime. They were born and Putin was already a president. And it's, it's something very strange, very, uh, very scary because they just can't imagine world without him. 
and uh, we try to do something. We try to spread information. Uh, of course, uh, different people have different goals. Some people try to spread uh, panic inside Russia, spread fear, spread something like that. But uh, uh, I think that I'm against it because uh, negative emotions are not the best way to spread information and uh, negative emotions for me uh, are not uh, our allies in this battle. Uh, because uh, in my opinion, the best way to spread information is uh, maybe to find uh, people inside Russia who may be interested in it. For example, uh, relatives of soldiers, uh, their friends, their families, uh, and so on. Uh, because uh, in Russia, everybody believes that uh, uh, their army is doing special operations inside Ukraine. They're saving us from ourselves and so on. And uh, they think that uh, their children, their husbands who are battling inside Ukraine are completely safe and everything is okay with them. But it's not true. Uh, the true information is that they have uh, already uh, 13 and a half uh, thousand killed soldiers and so on. And uh, maybe uh, their families even won't see these uh, people because uh, they won't uh, transport uh, dead bodies back to Russia. Uh, so my goal is to spread truth to spread uh, real information, uh, information about the war, that it's real war, it's not an operation, it's not a conflict inside Ukraine, it's war be between Ukraine and Russia. And may, it's may, all. May I ask how, you, how you've been doing that, given yeah. how locked down and how cut off uh, Russia has made internet access um, yes, outside definitely. the country? Uh, uh, at first days of Russian invasion, we used uh, different social media, uh, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and so, so on. But then uh, Russian government decided to ban all the social media because they understand that um, we can use the social media as a source of uh, information and uh, we, really, we really used them. So they just banned the social media but uh, nowadays we use special services, VPN, and uh, we visit uh, Russian social media like Vkontakte or uh, Odnoklassniki, something like that. And uh, we try to spread information inside this social media. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I didn't have any positive feedback right now because uh, when I tried to spread this information, the only thing which I maybe uh, receive is uh, negative. Uh, they wish me not very good things, but I hope that uh, mm, they have adequate people and I hope that uh, people who understand, who really understand the situation, they just won't show it and they just make some decisions uh, and so on. So I hope that uh, I see only the worst part of Russian nation. Ivana, thank you, Jakovio. Uh, I had another question both to, um, actually just a thought to Juliana and to Ivan is that I learned and about your activities, Juliana, of course it was written about in the Washington Post and the cyber partisans when the problems of the election of Lukashenko was, uh, uh, came to realization some years ago. But within um, a solidarity network for artists and 16 Beaver, and it was a, 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 a meeting that 16 Beaver has been holding as an assembly every week of various actors and agents and artists and cultural producers who are located within Ukraine and in the region as well. And so that's my question is, 
you see the optics of this and you see the optics of the Putin regime or the, 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 the regime of the Kremlin, the language is so Stalin-esque, it's so Soviet, it's so nostalgic. You, you seem to, it's, it's immersed in a generation that's so long ago. And then I see the optics of what are, I'm seeing within the art community and within the, oppos the opposition activist community within Ukraine and outside. And it's another generation. It's a generation, as you said, Ivan was born during Putin's regime that are simply saying, this is a pro-democratic movement. This is not about you know, being a national identity. This is about being a free individual. And so I'm wondering how the, the solidarity networks of Ukraine are actually working, um, or, or of the artists that are working. And this is something that uh, we will be be raising on Tuesday in our session at um, on the 22nd, which is how important are these solidarity networks outside of the country as well? It is very important. I can say on behalf of Belarus, we have many activists, uh, artists, activists that now advocate for changes in Belarus. Uh, we have a free Belarus theater in London who, you know, shows through the plays um, in London of what's going on in Belarus, trying to explain the situation, try to explain how Lukashenko came to power, why he stayed, and why it's so hard for people to change the regime and why people are as far mm -hmm. to democratic values, to European values. At the end of the day, Belarus is a um, respectively smaller country in Europe. It doesn't want to be associated with Russia. It doesn't want to be part of this huge empire. We're a separate country. Um, we have many, the so-called intelligentsia, intelli intelligentsia people um, from different parts of art, I would say writers, musicians, um, painters, um, and many more who are, you know, at the front um, of this sometimes, you know, protest. They try to show what's going on through, the, through their art. Uh, they try to reach to as many people as possible uh, within Belarus and outside of Belarus. So we do collaborate with people um, from that field. And I think it's in a sense inter interconnected also what cyber partisans are doing because this imaginary is also very important in order to reach to the audience, in order to explain why and what we're doing. Um, so in that sense, I think it plays an important role. Uh, and I want to just personally make a comment about Ukrainian um, artists that actually join the forces right now. We see musicians who are now protecting the territory of Kiev, who used to sing, you know, and be on a tour in America, but then they return to Ukraine, they got the gun and they're protecting themselves. So I think art in a sense, obviously it pushes the civilization forward. It helps us to remember who we are as humans and what we aspire to. And it is a, a very important part of any, I think, opposition and um, activist movement in Eastern Europe. But in the end of the day, you know, as in Ukraine, we see it, it all depends on what you are ready to do for people to protect your land. So I'm very inspired how uh, people are so united in Ukraine as well. And we do something similar, see some, something similar in Belarus as well. I'd love to jump in at this point and start to introduce some of the questions from our attendees. Um, uh, the first question I'll ask is from Flavin Judd, and the question is this, now that Belarus is basically a vassal state of Russia, have the targets of the activists expanded? Juliana, maybe this question is for you. Sure. So cyber partisans are working on many targets right now within Belarus, that, and these targets are connected to in a sense, Russian infrastructure, or they somehow coordinated, um, because we know Putin basically made Lukashenko his own puppet, and now um, does what he wants in Belarus, even though he, he's not, you know, in charge of Belarusian people. Uh, but we can't reveal exactly what these targets are, just because we don't discuss any plans for the future. Once it happens, it happens, but definitely they are looking into ways how to uh, help Belarusians, um, you know, get rid of Russian military troops from the territory of Belarus. We have an additional question um, here by Renata Mustafina. The question is this, well, first of all, a thank you for this great panel. Um, and the question is for Ivan, how do you deal with the widespread discourse in Russia that there is no one truth and that there are fakes from both sides? How do you justify that your information is not just another fake news? Um, 
Thank you for your question. Uh, it's really very important to understand where are fakes uh, and uh, which information is true. Um, we believe only governmental sites and uh, um, media like CNN, BBC, and so on. So it's like uh, independent media. Uh, we believe only independent media. In Russia, there also were, were a lot of uh, independent media like uh, Medusa, uh, Echo Moskvi, and so on. But they all are all closed. So they really don't have this independent, independent media. And they have only national channels uh, which spread propaganda. And uh, as I already told, our goal is to overcome this propaganda. It's very hard because they really believe that uh, fakes are from both sides. Uh, I'm also not sure that all our information is true, but I'm completely sure that uh, majority of uh, information in Ukraine is true. Of course, uh, some information like uh, uh, killed Ukrainian soldiers, for example. It may not be um, in public, um, uh, like uh, spreading in public, because uh, this information is very hard to understand psychologically. And uh, it's uh, also very, very important uh, right now uh, to keep this uh, psychological state uh, positive state because uh, uh, we are all fighting now and uh, you have already mentioned uh, uh, Ukrainian artists who are uh, holding guns in their hands and protecting Kiev, protecting their their cities. It's, uh, it's their fight. Uh, other people try to help uh, volunteers. Uh, sort people uh, use uh, cyber army, IT army and so on to help our, uh, our government and so on. So everybody is fighting now. And uh, during this fight, it's very important to be positive to, because I guess that uh, everybody understands that we will win. It's impossible to lose in this fight because uh, we are fighting against uh, very cruel, but very stupid enemy they're really very stupid because they uh, they try to do something, they try to uh, spread their propaganda, they try to make some like uh, genius uh, moves to uh, occupy our cities, but uh, they don't understand the real situation in Ukraine. I think that it's also a very important point that inside Russia, uh, this government, uh, top management of Russia, I don't know, president and close people to president, they are, they really didn't understand real situation in Ukraine because they heard only what they want to hear uh, because uh, people around them are afraid of them and they are afraid of truth like their nation. The government is also afraid of truth because even uh, 30 minutes ago, Putin gave a press conference in which he told that uh, his operation is uh, going uh, by plan, everything is okay. And uh, people will believe him because uh, all national channels will spread this information. And of course, they will believe that everything is okay. But we understand that nothing is okay because our army is much stronger than this thought. And uh, we are fighting them. And I guess that it's only a matter of time when we will win. Marta, you're muted, unfortunately. Before we take the next question, um, I, I wanted to comment on that. Thank you, Ivan and Juliana. Uh, when I uh, spoke with Scott about this panel, he, we spoke about the, the kind of messaging. And Scott, I think you said, oh, the, the, the TikTokers in Ukraine are really killing it. <laughs> There's something about the, the, the kind of the, the tropes that are coming out or the, the kind of transgressions that are coming out visually from this war that, as Ivano said, 
that you would say are incredibly, I, I don't know, positive, but actually ironic and sarcastic. Um, for example, all many of the signs throughout the country now being changed into directional signs where they have taken down the names of the cities and instead put directionally the words Nahui, excuse me, um, that were used by the Snake Island uh, uh, defenders and and telling and spreading them throughout the country and positioning them on road signs. Or we have the pickle lady and the graphics around the pickle lady uh, downing the drone. So the, it's in, incredibly interesting that at some point perhaps someone can collect all these various. Uh, uh, links to ironic transgressions um and sorry that was just a comment i, mean, Molly, I think I think, the kid, I think the kids call them memes um, <laughs> yes the kids call them memes. <laughs> the memes yeah you yeah, know who, who who's ever running your who's ever running your info ops uh, has a very strong meme game um what, what, what's been particularly uh, it's I, I, I think uh, Marta, at, at least as a consumer of 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 these videos and these memes, I would say that what's um, what's striking is the level of humor associated with it, um, and it's a it's a very strong tool of resistance to mock the other side, um, it, it, and and. Obviously, Yvonne, you had mentioned that your audience um, is Russia, but of course, this information operation is really directed to all of us. Um, and I would say, you know, for for since uh, 2016, the West has been quaking in its boots about the formidable information operations, active measures of the Russians, um, and my, uh, you know, you, 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 the, you know, the Ukrainians and um, uh, ha have really um, just com completely outperformed um, Russian propaganda here. Um, so uh, anyway, congratulations on, on, on actually uh, um, uh, getting that message out, which I'm sure is, uh, was unbelievably difficult. Um, do we want to go to the next question? Yeah, let's go. I mean, I can introduce the next question, which um, really I think is directed to um, all three of you, Juliana, Ivan, and you as well, Scott. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about it. And this is a question about the legal about the legal concerns around cyber activism. Um, so here's our question: How do the cyber partisans relate to questions of legality or illegality? Um, uh, of their action in terms of the local legal framework and in terms of international law. Uh, are the cyber partisan strategies oriented by the legal framework at all? Uh, and the comment attached to this is that, that this person also asked this question because the international human rights field is becoming increasingly legalistic and some disruptive tactics may be dismissed as potentially violent by legal professionals and human rights defenders. Um, so I think that everybody present here would be really interested to hearing a little bit more about what kinds of legal frameworks might be uh, for, for foreground in your mind, but also how we might understand these actions from both local and international legal perspectives. Sure, I'll let, let me probably start, right? I find this question really interesting, and it's always important to think through the strategies and tactics rega regarding the ethics of right of the movement. Uh, so let me first start with saying that there is no law in Belarus. So there is no proper law enforcement. Any system is working in Belarus right now. So the regime is committing crimes openly. They openly admit it. Uh, they admit it secretly over their phone conversations that cyber partisans also leaked. So there is no proper and lawful way to, you know, how you can do in Europe in order to protest and resist the regime. So cyber partisans were attacking the state companies, the regime's infrastructure, uh, keeping these people accountable for their crimes they're committing right now in Belarus under the, let's say, international law. They didn't leave any other ways. They didn't leave any other tools for people to protest, resist, or even say, you know, you committed the crime that, that's wrong. You know, let's persecute, but they don't do this. 
Um, instead, you know, people, some people even died in Belarus. They were killed by the regime's people since 2020, even before that year. Uh, people being raped, people were beating up in prison cells and tortured, and there are no proper tools in order to resist this regime. But even considering all of this, have a partisans in the larger coalition superdeep, they're using only nonviolent methods that are confirmed by, by the even United Nations. Um, they only attack the infrastructure, um, the, you know, the regime's infrastructure, not um, trying not to affect ordinary citizens. And just because of that, there is no law, the regime created terror, they're trying to find creative tools using their mind, the digital tools, something that the dictator lacks. And as for the international community, um, I would say that, you know, Europe got rid of their dictators in 20th century mostly, so they don't remember how it is to fight dictators. And we can't rely on Europe, as we can see. Europe is not going to come and save Belarusians from the oppression and terror. We can only rely on ourselves, on our minds, on the ways we can you know, help Belarusians, help our citizens and people. Um, so I think it's always important to keep in mind, let's say, how France was fighting uh, back in the Second World War and how Great Britain was helping the resistance movement within France or the solidarity movement in Poland. It had a lot of violence, yet Europe was in full support of this movement, but it happened long ago. So, you know, it's easy to forget or not understand the context of what's going on in Belarus. Um, so in that sense, you know, again, we're relying on people which not trying, we're not using any nonviolent movement and we try to advocate and get some help, but also, you know, Europe, Western countries, United States can help only to some extent, even in the war with Ukraine, as we see, you know, they can provide with some ammunition and weapons, but only people in Ukraine on the ground can protect themselves and they're fighting on their own for the democracy and for the values we believe in. So this, I think, is very important to take into consideration. Yeah, I also want to add about Ukraine. Um, I guess that uh, we are not uh, afraid about some uh, legal actions inside Ukraine because uh, I've mentioned that uh, our government organized this armies. Uh, about international judgment, I think that um, international community understand that we are fighting for our freedom, not even for democracy, we are fighting for freedom. It's a big difference because uh, we were fighting for democracy in 2013 and 2014 during the revolution. And we, we won this battle and we won a democracy for our nation. But now we are fighting for freedom. And uh, uh, this is war. It's real war because uh, they're killing people. They're killing children. Uh, right now, uh, there are about uh, uh, 100 killed children in Ukraine. It's a very big amount of people, and it's 2022. But uh, our people are uh, sleeping in basements. They, uh, they are afraid of uh, going out of their homes because they understand that they can throw bombs on their hands. So I think that uh, our... IT army, we are fighting and uh, it's our method. And uh, I think that uh, we have frameworks, but it's not legal frameworks. It's like moral frameworks because uh, we are uh, Europeans, we are democratic nation and we are modern nation and we have this moral frameworks. Our enemy, it's doesn't have these frameworks, moral, uh, legal, and so on. So uh, I think that legal question is not very important right now. Um, as somebody who both teaches cybersecurity, international law, and legal philosophy, <laughs> the, 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 I, I have a special interest in this question. I would just say that you know there are different views about the law what the, the nature of the law. Um, my own view is, and, and I think it's the correct view, um, is that just because something is the law doesn't mean that you're obligated to follow it, especially when the regime in question, the system in question is extraordinarily unjust. 
Um, and I think, so let's just take the Belarusian case and then the Ukrainian case, okay? So the Belarusians are, they're, they're engaged in a rebellion, in, a rebel, in an attempt to overthrow what is in everyone's view, um, uh, a, a highly, highly unjust, uh, brutal regime. And so from a moral point of view, it's irrelevant, I think, that it's against the law in Belarus, um, even if it was an effective uh, law enforcement regime, uh, you, people have rights. I mean, this country, the United States, was founded on a revolution against tyranny. Um, and I think Lukashen Lukashenko's um, uh, um, uh, regime certainly counts as tyrannical. Um, I would say when, when, when in the Ukrainian case, I mean, look, they're, 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 they're in a war against um, brutal invaders. Um, they have the right to respond in self-defense. That so that having that having and so they're not also violating Ukrainian law. I imagine. I mean, it seems as if it's been suspended um, uh, uh, by at least enforcement by the government's calling um, uh, for this IT army. I would just say that it's no joke, though. If you participate, if a civilian participates in hostilities, that is a very dangerous thing to do. Um, it's very dangerous because um, if a civilian is not part of a regular army, they don't have the rights of, um, uh, of uh, combatants. Um, they are known as civilians participating in hostilities, and they can be they can be killed. Now, this seems to be, in some sense, irrelevant in the Russian case because they don't seem to be, care that much about distinguishing between um, civilians who are not participating in hostilities and combatants. So, I would just say that from a legal perspective, um, whatever the what, uh, whatever the story is, morally speaking, I. My, my, my moral intuitions tell me that what um, uh, Yuliana and Ivana are engaged in um, would be um, uh, like, I, I, sounds to me like heroic. Um, that having been said, please do not, if you're in the United States, engage in this activity um, donate, help refugees, do lots of things, but you are opening yourself up to legal consequences if you try to do this in the United States. Please don't, I mean, I, that would, I'm not, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, but I would just say there are other ways to participate um, if you're in the United States. I think that we are, um, Scott, thank you. Um, I think we are at our time, Molly, unless there are other questions. Uh, I believe actually in the final three responses, you have managed to cover the two remaining questions we have. And yeah. so I'm very grateful for that. In particular, um, what seems to me like what is emerging is a really challenging conversation about limits about about how much action individuals are willing to take um, about this line between co individual consequences government consequences institutional consequences uh, and and what is becoming apparent which is in the very challenging situation both of you are in Juliana and Ivan um, so many of these structures that we all rely on uh, are in fact no longer viable. Uh, and so to a certain extent, you are faced with a much different um, um, set of, of decisions to make. So, so yes, yeah, so anyway, Marta, uh, you, the answer to your question is, I believe we've run through the majority of our questions. Um, so perhaps, uh, Marta, you'd like to say a few closing words. Um, I thank you, Molly. I'd like to thank everyone who participated today and also uh, Scott, you really hit it on the nail there in saying that these, that Juliana and Ivan both are heroic um, in their efforts and in the efforts of those they're working with. And I'm very grateful that you were able to attend today. 
Ivan, I know that under the curfews, this is a very precarious and difficult situation for you even to be involved in this Zoom. So um, thank you and uh, keep strong, keep courageous. Uh, and uh, we will, we're creating our own solidarity network here in terms of individuals that are involved in sorts of ways um, in tracking this and how this manifests as its own trope of art. Uh, and on Friday, we invite you to return. On Friday, we have Professor Kate Brown from MIT who has written the manual of survival around the future of Chernobyl and two individuals also from within Ukraine, Svetlana Matvienko, who will speak about um, these situations of nuclear colonialism to nuclear terrorism, which everyone has uh, been uh, made aware of with the occupation of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And also Oleksiy Rudinsky, an artist also. These are people working within the art world who are now turning to activism and to different forms of agency. Uh, Oleksiy Rudinsky, who's going to be speaking about the exploitation of energy sources and Ukraine being a territory of a tran transit um, for this. So please join us at 12 o'clock on Friday. Uh, again, thank you everyone. These events will be recorded. Please join the RIS, R E E E S uh, website. And once again, I'm very grateful for Molly for your chairing such a courageous party, uh, part, uh, courageous, part, courageous, courageous department in housing these uh, and organizing these events. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.